This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan González. As we turn to Chile, where celebrations are continuing after Gabriel Boric's presidential victory Sunday. The 35-year-old leftist is a former student leader who's set to become Chile's youngest president ever. He easily defeated the far right-wing candidate, José Antonio Cast, by winning over 55 percent of the vote. Boric has vowed to fight for progressive social reforms and overhaul the neoliberal economic policies left by the U.S.-backed dictatorship of General Augusto Pinochet. Boric's election comes after two years of massive, peaceful demonstrations in Chile over inequality, high cost of living and privatization. On Sunday, Gabriel Boric addressed supporters in Santiago. Chileans, I receive this mandate with humility and a tremendous sense of responsibility. We have an enormous challenge. I know that in the coming years, the future of our country is at stake. So I guarantee that I will be a president who cares for democracy and does not risk it, listens more than what he speaks, seeks unity, and attends to the needs of the people daily. I will firmly fight against the privileges of a few, and I will work every day for the quality of the Chilean family. I will do my best, my best to live up to the trust you've placed in me. We do not forget justice, truth, respect. We go now to Santiago, Chile, where we're joined by two guests. Javier Manzi is an activist with Chile's largest feminist advocacy group, um, the Coordinadora Feminista 8M. Also with us is Pablo Ubufon, a member of Chile's Solidar um, Solidaridad Movement, the Solidarity Movement, an anti-capitalist and feminist organization. Um, we thank you both for being with us. Pablo, let's begin with you. Talk about the significance of Boric's victory. Hi, Amy. Thank you for having me again. Um, so, Boric, Boric's victory uh, uh, on Sunday <clears throat> is actually a huge victory for, uh, for the social movements and the Chilean people. After two years of uh, social and popular revolts in October 2019, uh, in, the mid, in the middle of a huge political and social crisis in Chile, we see that finally there's an opening for a progressive government in Chile that we haven't had in, in over 40, almost 50 years. And so it's a very interesting moment for Chile, uh, even though that Boric has always been a moderate in his own coalition, this is a truly uh, interesting moment, uh, a new political cycle for Chile. Also, because the, 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 the first uh, round of the election, Boric was second, and the first uh, place was for Jose Antonio Cast, who was uh, the candidate of the, of the old guard of the, Pinochet, of the Pinochet's right wing, uh, a candidate that was uh, mostly pandering to a far right wing agenda and base, similar to Bolsonaro and Orban and Trump. And so, uh, the, the, the fact that Boric won in the second round meant that, uh, that there was a part of the electorate that didn't vote for him in the first round and that mobilized for, for his campaign in the second round. And that is, that's definitely uh, because of sectors that were involved in the uh, popular revolt uh, that were not really happy about his uh, platform in the first round, but that uh, seeing the threat of neo-fascist uh, of a neo-fascist government decided to take to the streets and campaign for this this victory. And uh, Pablo, I wanted to ask you: the victory of, of Boric happens in the context of a an effort for a a rewriting of of the Chilean constitution. Could you talk about that and the movement that developed around that and how it spilled over as well into the election? Yeah, so one of the main demands of the popular revolt in October 2019 was a new constitution. It was a way to take all the demands that were being uh, uh, pushed uh, by the social movements in the past 20, 30 years into political global change. And so we had uh, the, the, um, a, a referendum for a new constitution in October last year and, and the, the, the alternative for a new constitution won with an 80 percent of the vote. So that means that uh, um, a, a majority, a large majority of the, of the Chilean population wants a new constitution. And so, and then 
uh, the election for the members of that constitutional convention was won by a majority of anti-neoliberal um, uh, representatives, both from leftist political parties such as Frente Amplio and the Communist Party, who are now the it's, they're going to be the governing uh, administration and coalition, but also from independents from the social movements like the feminist movement and the uh, environmentalist groups, but also the indigenous peoples who, who had uh, a guaranteed representation in the Constitutional Convention. So that, uh, that confirmation of the Constitutional Convention is very relevant to this new cycle, because it means that uh, both the new Constitution has, uh, has the support of a progressive government, but also that this progressive government does not have any excuse uh, to uh, make only timid changes, only uh, mild changes uh, in the political institutions in the context of the drafting of a new anti-neoliberal constitution. And you mentioned uh, that the, uh, the defeat of the right-wing or pro-fascist uh, sectors in Chile. Uh, Fifty years ago, there was another uh, legally elected governor, uh, uh, government in Chile, uh, Allende's uh, Unidad Popular, but the military took action uh, to crush that movement and, in, and, in, and bring in the Pinochet era. I'm wondering your concern about how the Chilean military is reacting or will react in the future uh, to this new government? That's a, that's a very good question. Well, history does not repeat itself exactly uh, the way it happened before. So the first thing is that uh, there, there is impunity in Chile, even with the, the crimes against humanity and violations of human rights in the dictatorship, in the democratic transition, and during the revolt. So uh, we, we saw the way the military behaved during the revolt when the Presidente Piñera uh, declared a, 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 a state of exception and took the military to the street to uh, placate the, the revolt. But we also saw how they were very, uh, very wary of the political and, and criminal repercu repercussions of their behavior in the streets. So there were threats of, a, of a, another coup during those days. But it was completely uh, outrageous to think that they were going to uh, start a coup against a right-wing government. Now, there's, of course, where we have in our bodies, in our minds, the memory of the coup d'etat of 1973 and the 17 years long dictatorship. But there's also the experience of those years, the experience of the resistance, and the belief that uh, the people is, is politically prepared to confront the military, as we did in, in October 2019. But also, the, it, it's very important to remember that Boric is not Allende. He is a progressive. He's definitely, uh, his base is on the left and even in the, in the popular movements who mobilized in October. But he's not Allende, and he's talking about making moderate changes and responsible changes. So what we can expect is that, that the government is going to be uh, in, in a contradiction or a tension between uh, a more moderate position following the, the governance, the, the, the 90s and 2000s governance, uh, and being pushed by the social movements towards a more radical agenda. So I think that the contradiction is not going to be between the, the government and the military, but between the government and those two poles, those two uh, axes of political change in Chile. And also, do you see the uh, the trend that has happened here in Chile uh, similar to what appears to be going on in uh, several other uh, countries uh, in the region? I'm thinking specifically of the election of Alberto Fernandez in Argentina in 2019, of Luis Arce in Bolivia in 2020, of uh, Pedro Castillo in Peru this year, and Xiomara Castro uh, in Honduras. Do you see Latin America once again shifting in a more progressive and social democratic and and uh, and radical direction? I think it's a it's a moment of huge opportunity and promise for Latin America. There's going to be a new cycle of of at least progressive governments uh, that would ha would have the opportunity 
to uh, work on regional integration, on regional solidarity uh, uh, with a more uh, progressive agenda. But the situation is very different after, during and after the pandemic, where, uh, we're, and even before, we're experiencing uh, a global crisis in the economy. Uh, there is huge instability in political terms in, all, in, in, in these countries. But and there's also a, a new far right wing uh, in, in some governments, but also in neo-fascist movements in the streets. So the scenario is a bit different. It's not going to be exactly the same. Uh, but it definitely it's a moment for opportunity. And one thing that, that for, for, Chile, for the Chilean government and the, for the Chilean people is going to be very important is how uh, there's an international campaign by those governments that are already in power in the rest of Latin America to free political prisoners in Chile. We still have political prisoners from the revolt, people who are in pretrial detention for more than a year and people who have been sentenced with a uh, few uh, evidence and and um, and a, a lot of impunity for agents of the state who have committed violence and mutilated people. So to, today, the first responsibility of the government in terms of international relations, uh, it's to uh, work for an international campaign to free prisoners. And I wanted to, to take the opportunity to call activists and intellectuals in the United States to join us in an international campaign to end political prison in Chile. Uh, I think that Angela Davis and Noam Chomsky, for instance, who have been in this show, are very known by the Chilean people and the Latin American peoples. And it would be very interesting to join forces to fight political prison in Chile. Well, Pablo Abafon, we want to thank you for being with us, member of Chile's Solidarity. As we turn now to Javier Manzi, an activist with Chile's largest feminist advocacy group, it's known as the Coordinadora Feminista um, Ocho M, uh, March 8th, International Women's Day. Um, Javier, can you talk about the significance of this being a grassroots movement victory and how people organized? Hi, Amy. Well, the first thing to say is that this was a popular victory. This is the victory of the people. And this shift uh, of from a far-right uh, agenda and the alternative that they were offering us was uh, for us um, the demonstration of how of the extent no, or of the alternatives of a neoliberal uh, uh, agenda of a Pinochetist uh, continuity and the necessity for us as women, as feminists, to put a step um, forward for an uh, alternative for a different life. So for us, it's important to say that for since the first election, um, the very second day from the uh, Coordinadora Feminista 8M, we made a public statement that we were going to do campaign for Gabriel Boric and that we were going to, as many other grassroots organizations, um, play a protagonist role in this moment. And this is very different, for instance, than in Brazil, you see, like, because we, we knew that it was not enough to say no to a candidate, but we had to make uh, an effective campaign for uh, the victory of Gabriel Boric in this second round. And could you talk about why uh, why your organization decided to back Boric? What was it about his program that attracted you? I would say it's two things. In the first place, we knew the threat for our lives, for our rights, for everything that we have conquered as a social movement, as women, as uh, from the community of LGBT uh, that was being uh, in a threat and how Gast and he, the far right agenda that he was uh, representing us was uh, an absolute uh, a menace for us. So then we had to know and we knew that Gabriel Boric, who's, um, who comes from a, a left a platform, but also from the mobilization, from the students' mobilizations of 2011, could um, protagonize a shift on the continuity of neoliberalism in Chile throughout the last 30 years. And our main uh, purpose now is to keep on shifting in that 
uh, agenda of transformation, we have a program, a feminist program, and, and especially with the aims, the purposes and the desires of the revolt of 2019. And could you talk about the coalition Boric is a part of, the I Approve Dignity Coalition, what political movements are represented within it, and the importance of the student movement uh, in propelling uh, uh, volunteers and, uh, and, uh, and activists for that coalition? Yes. Uh, Pro Dignidad is a platform, a, a left platform, a very diverse platform as well, that has a um, progressive agenda. And for us, it's important to say that it's not only their victory, it's uh, other, uh, over, um, it's a victory of people who never went to vote before. You see, this is the election with the most votation since uh, the vote is uh, voluntary here in Chile. And even though it's, we can see the diversity there, and we can see, of course, the, um, the extent of the, and the diversity of different social movements be, be, um, even the, be in a pro dignidad, in dignidad but also outside that a pro dignidad that uh, in a unity uh, made possible this victory for us it's very important to say that uh, this is a victory of a in a way of a radical tenderness of the people and the and the aim of a radical transformation and that feminism as well as environmental movements are in the um we are working to, to, towards that uh, justice, uh, social justice and social transformation. And the demand of feminists, particularly now of Boric, who will take power in March? Yes, Boric has said three very important things. First, he's committed with the constituent process uh, that's part of the revolt. He's also committed with the agenda of, of the feminist agenda and the rights of uh, the feminist movements we are pushing forward, such as abortion rights, uh, sexual uh, reproduction justice, and of course the, an agenda of uh, with a commit, commitment with human rights and the justice, reparation and truth uh, for the violation of human rights during the government of Sebastián Piñera. These three things are for us like a main goal and a main commitment and of course uh, the permanent uh, responsibility with all of those who uh, went to vote, and not only to vote, but with the uh, that mobilize and organize to make this victory possible. Javier Amanzi, we want to thank you for being with us, activists with Chile's largest feminist advocacy group, the Coordinadora Feminista 8MA.